Your Excellency, Mr. Salman Khurshid, External Affairs Minister of India, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking the Ministry of External Affairs and its partners, IDSA and FIKI, for organizing this important gathering. The previous speakers have each touched on the India-ASEAN vision. There can be no doubt that partnership and prosperity is a worthwhile aspiration for all of us. The question is, how can we translate this phrase into action and reality? India and ASEAN are natural partners, intrinsically, intrinsically bound by history, geography and culture. Our ties go back centuries, when India first began spreading its roots to Southeast Asia. Since then, there has been a mutual affinity between our people, whether through, whether through trade, cultural or political linkages. It is a partnership that has grown stronger over time. ASEAN today is a key pillar of India's Look East policy, complementing India's economic reforms and liberalization. India, an emerging power on the verge of becoming the third largest economy in the world, is in turn an important economic and strategic partner for ASEAN. Our mutual prosperity is closely tied. It is perhaps in recognition of these common historical bonds and the realization that we are linked in more ways than one that the leaders of ASEAN and India endorsed two years ago in New Delhi the vision statement of the ASEAN-India Commemorative Summit. The vision is premised on three key pillars. The first pillar is in the political and security sphere. ASEAN and India continue to enhance our close partnership through regular bilateral dialogues and consultations, as well as through our interactions in broader regional fora, such as the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus, ADMM Plus. India's commitment to dialogue with ASEAN and recognition of ASEAN's centrality in the regional architecture has helped to foster trust and preserve regional stability. Under the socio-political pillar, our cooperation has also grown steadily. The success of any regional community is reflected in the quality of the life of the people who live in their community. This is why functional cooperation is so important, and I'm glad that it continues to grow in areas such as human resource development, transport, infrastructure, and health. The third pillar is economic. India was ASEAN's sixth largest trading partner in 2012, with total trade rising by 4.6% from US $68.4 billion in 2011 to US $71.6 billion in 2012. The increase is in part at least due to the ASEAN-India FTA Trading Goods Agreement, which entered into force in January 2010. The figures for 2013 are not available yet, but we should be on course towards meeting the 2015 target of US $100 billion set by the leaders at the 10th ASEAN-India Summit in November 2012. In a bid to enhance cooperation across, the, across these three pillars, our leaders agreed to establish the ASEAN-India Centre, which was opened in New Delhi in July last year. The AIC will help us coordinate efforts to, co to implement cooperation across all three pillars. ASEAN will work closely with India to make this a success. There is little doubt then that ASEAN and India are important stakeholders in each other's prosperity. But this begs the question, what has our partnership and prosperity really achieved? If we are honest with ourselves, we have some way to go before achieving our ASEAN-India vision. If we are to realize such a vision, intra-regional intra linkages between ASEAN and India have to grow deeper and faster. However, two key challenges need to be addressed. Strengthening trade and investment and strengthening connectivity. I spoke about our growing economic ties a short while ago. India ASEAN's high potential for trade growth and healthy increase in the volume of trade and investment flows are factors both in both our favor. Yet ASEAN-India trade remains relatively low compared to ASEAN's other dialogue partners. For example, the Republic of Korea, which is ASEAN's fifth trading partner, just above India in rank, has a total trade with ASEAN of US $124.5 billion compared with India's US $71.6 billion. It is clear that more can be done to boost our two-way trade levels. The question is how? The first initiative is the ASEAN-India Free Trade Agreement. This will be a major milestone in our cooperation, particularly with the finalization of the ASEAN-India Services and Investment Agreements in August last year. I understand the signing of the agreements is scheduled to take place this year. The AIFTA AI will eliminate barriers to trade 
facilitate cross-border movement of goods and services and improve market access. In short, to enable India and ASEAN to not only achieve but exceed the US $100 billion target, trade target set by our leaders. We should expedite the entry into force of the agreements and encourage businesses to take full advantage of the FTA. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, is the second initiative that we can utilize to boost trade. The RCEP has the potential to transform our region into an integrated market covering 45% of the world's population with a combined GDP of about a third of the current global GDP. It is envisioned to be one of the largest FTAs in the world and will enhance our market access to the region by overcoming the limitations of the individual ASEAN plus one FTAs. RCEP will lower trade barriers and address emerging issues that are relevant to new business realities. An early conclusion of RCEP will entrench India's strategic presence in the region, enhance its links with ASEAN's other dialogue partners, and support a regional architecture that is open, inclusive, and outward-looking. The second area with much untapped potential is connectivity, in particular air connectivity. India is one of only two dialogue partners sharing a land border with ASEAN. That India and ASEAN are connected by history and geography provide a good foundation for us to do more. There are ongoing efforts to improve land and institutional links between ASEAN and India, such as the Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport Project, the India-Myanmar-Thailand Trilateral Highway, the Mekong-India Economic Corridor, and ASEAN-India ICT Link. We should continue to actively pursue and expand these efforts. While we have made much progress in enhancing maritime and road links, traveller demand for air services between India and ASEAN is still soaring. For example, total number of tourist arrivals from India to ASEAN amounted to 2.7 million arrivals in 2011, an increase of 11 percent from 2010. Our carriers have recognized the growing demand for air travel between our regions with the launch of joint ventures such as Air Asia, Air Asia India and one between Tata and Singapore Airlines. This is an encouraging development with the rising affluence, affluence of the middle class in both India and ASEAN, there is scope for many more air connections to be made. An ASEAN-India air transport agreement that includes the liberalization of passenger services will go a long way towards achieving better air connectivity. Enhanced air connectivity will bring tremendous benefits to both our regions by increasing business passengers and tourist traffic. This will in turn boost business opportunities such as investments in tourism and hospitality sectors, not to mention creating new employment opportunities for thousands. The flow of people, goods, services, ideas and innovation will increase. Greater people-to-people -people interactions will also facilitate regional integration, bringing both our regions closer as our maritime links did centuries ago. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the past two decades have witnessed enormous progress in ASEAN-India relations which culminated in the elevation of our partnership, of our relationship to a strategic partnership in December 2012. India's potential is being unlocked and its strategic weight is increasing. As an emerging power, India plays an important role in shaping a balanced regional order. We welcome India stepping up its efforts to engage ASEAN, and I hope that as the discussions at the Delhi, at the, at the Delhi Dialogue get underway, we will reinforce our commitment to build and intensify those links. Thank you.